Kyoto Kotokatoa, uh, all NCPAC's Fanao and the member of the Otepoti community, Hairemai. And I would also like to welcome the participants joining from Hawaii and the members who are going to watch this video clip later on. Thank you so much for joining the public talk co-hosted <coughs> by the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, the University of Otago, and Spark M. Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. I am glad and honored to have Honorary Rowan Downing QC as our speaker and have an opportunity to hear his life experience in Cambodia and Vanuatu. Um, to give you some quick housekeeping announcement, um, this seminar uh, will be roughly for an hour, including the first part of presentation and following question and answer session, and will be facilitated in the form of webinar in which all audience can only communicate with us by using the chat function. So when you have a question or comments to share, feel free to use the chat function whenever you want. Then later in the you know, suitable timing, I would like to read it out and ask for the feedback from um, you know, Rowan. And now I'd like to invite Professor Wood Sweetman, the Dean of School of Social Science to welcome and introduce Honorary Downing QC. Kia ora folks, uh, thanks Sun Yong. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, briefly introduce uh, the seminar. Uh, so the Honourable Rowan Downing QC is a senior Australian lawyer uh, who supported a wide range of projects for promoting uh, the rule of law and peace building uh, in more than 14 countries uh, over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, to give a few examples, uh, he was a judge of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal in Vanuatu from 1993 to 1995 as part of AusAid's uh, work in, in that country. During this period, he provided continuing legal education courses to members of the legal profession, and he introduced new processes in the courts for the protection of women and of children. Uh, similarly, in 2006, uh, he took up a position as an international judge for the United Nations assistance to the Khmer Rouge Tribunal uh, at the extraordinary chambers uh, of the courts of Cambodia. In December 2014, Rowan was voted by the UN General Assembly uh, to the bench of the United Nations Dispute Tribunal in Geneva. Uh, he has a background, as you'd expect, in the study of law. Uh, he was awarded a Commonwealth Government Scholarship uh, in 1971 to study for a Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor of Arts degree at the University of Melbourne, uh, and he completed a Master of Laws degree in 1980 from the Melbourne Law School. He's going to speak to us today. Uh, on the title of Promotion of the Rule of Law, Reflection on the Experience in Vanuatu uh, and Cambodia, and I invite him now to deliver his uh, address. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, yes, I'll talk about uh, my experience in Vanuatu and in Cambodia, and I'll do that from a practical point of view rather than an academic point of view. Uh, I was asked initially uh, to indicate how I obtained this appointment. And I should say that I'd been in the practice of the law as a barrister for some time, and I was becoming a little bit bored uh, and thought that I could make a decent contribution to the rule of law uh, and uh, the place of law in development. And Michael Black, who was the Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Australia, uh, asked me one day if I would consider uh, being a judge in the Supreme Court in Vanuatu because the court had effectively collapsed. And I said, yes, I would. And uh, my first day, just to give you an idea of what it was like, was that early in the morning, I was in Australia on my farm and I was checking irrigation systems. I then flew to Vanuatu. I arrived at about 10... 10 o'clock in the evening, I was taken straight to a, uh, a meeting where I met the Deputy Premier of the People's Republic of China uh, and all the Ministers of State uh, of uh, Vanuatu, which at that stage was a very small place with only 200,000 people. I was sworn in as a judge the next day, which was Independence Day, 31st of July. 1993, it was, uh, the country at that stage had been independent for some 13 years. Uh, the following week, I went to the court, in fact, on the 
first day, uh, I walked in and found a complete mess. Uh, there were files dating back to 1971, which were just littered around the place. And then I had my first case. My first case was a, an appalling rape case. And I uh, found the gentleman guilty of the rape and then had to work out what sentence to apply. I had no idea of the mores of the society. I had come in to a Melanesian country without any briefing or background. So I delayed my sentence for six weeks because certainly the gentleman was going to get a sentence of some time. I ended up by giving him a life sentence because the rape was of such appalling magnitude. I then <clears throat> set about trying to tidy the court up a bit. I had a staff there of some 19 people. We had 1,370 cases in a backlog before the Supreme Court, including appeals cases. Uh, this was particularly difficult. And I was wishing to move as quickly as possible. My staff, who were the most delightful Ni Vanuatu, had another idea. And I threatened them with a cattle prod. And I still remember this because they said to me, what's a cattle prod? I said, oh, it's 6,000 volts of fun and frivolity. It will get you all moving. And after about three weeks, I calmed down. I realized that their pace of moving was not quite what I'd been used to, but they got things done. And it was a matter of my adjusting to Vanuatu, my learning what the culture was and what was important. And it was necessary for me to build a team of people who knew what they were doing. They appreciated what they were doing and that they weren't just processing pieces of paper, but they actually had involvement. So I started a training program and I trained the staff. And at the same time, I trained Ni Vanuatu lawyers through a uh, moot court system. Now, Vanuatu is actually a very complicated place. Uh, it has a law, land law, which makes the land law in uh, New Zealand and the land law in Australia like, look like the land law for simpletons. It is very, very complicated. And it took me some time to work that out as well. In fact, Vanuatu has seven systems of law. It has English common law, English statute law, French law, joint regulations up to 1980, because it was uh, a condominium between France and England. Then Vanuatu statute law, which supersedes all other, and then Vanuatu common law, and importantly, customary law. And <clears throat> it's necessary to understand that the chiefly system still exists quite well in Vanuatu. And the chiefs take their responsibility in relation to their people, uh, very, very uh, seriously. So it was a matter of how do we incorporate the chiefly system within the formal justice system? Because an inclusive system is something which is possibly going to work, uh, particularly for minor uh, matters. So the island court had already been established, but was defunct. So it was a matter of selecting chiefs, training chiefs, and establishing island or re-establishing island courts uh, on all of the islands which were inhabited in Vanuatu. I also decided that it was a good idea to uh, incorporate them more into the formal justice system. And I started using them as probationary officers. And I can give you an example. I had 19 young men who appeared before me and <clears throat> they had uh, actually stolen from their own people. They were man of fear, 
uh, Manafira, uh, they in fact own the land where Port Vila is to be found. And they're a fairly rich clan. And uh, they run the stevedoring business. And they, these 19, had arranged for a container full of alcohol to be placed outside the bond area on the port. They then cut a hole in the back of it and removed all the alcohol. They were stealing from their own village, from their own people. And they had been dealt with fairly severely. They were youngsters, they were 16, 17, 18. And the magistrate had put them into jail for some years and they appealed. And that, that might have been the beginning of their trouble because they came before me and my immediate reaction was, well, jail's not going to be of any use to these youngsters. Uh, it's not appropriate. <clears throat> um, I'll call for their chief. And as soon as I called for the chief, the 19 youngsters wanted to immediately abandon their appeal because they did not wish to be involved within the chiefly system because the chief would probably not not be terribly happy with what they'd done. And so I called the chief. I wouldn't allow them to abandon the appeal. And I appointed the chief a probation officer uh, for the purposes. And I placed them all within his charge, subject to certain conditions. So that was something which worked well. It incorporated the chief into the formal justice system, and that worked well. I had another case where there was a, a divorce, or actually it wasn't a divorce, I think uh, mum had died, and there was an issue of uh, the custody of two children. Now, the mother, uh, the deceased mother had come from the island of Malakula, and her village had a matriarchal system. The father came from Tana and from a village where there was a patriarchal system. And the grandmother from Malakula, she wanted full custody of the children, as would be the custom in Malakula. The father wanted full custody, as would have been the custom on Tana. So I determined that the best thing to do, because as a foreigner, how was I going to possibly approach this dispute in a sensible uh, manner, which was going to be culturally sensitive and appropriate. So I called for the paramount chief for Vanuatu and a chief, senior chief from Malakula and a senior chief from Tana to sit as mediators. And they took over a court and they went for three days and they mediated the matter. And when I went down to make final orders, everyone was happy. And that remained the case at least until 2003 when I last saw uh, the people involved. Now, <clears throat> there were also issues of uh, conflict of laws. Uh, because sometimes in, say, a deceased estate, uh, the children would do better under French law uh, and a spouse would do better under English law. Difficult issues, because you could also cut across, directly across, uh, the position of customary law, where the, if there was a woman involved, she would get nothing. Uh, the assets of the husband, if he died, would go to his brothers, his family. Uh, so there were three competing uh, areas. Customary law in those cases did not uh, supersede the law of either France or England because it was a question of human rights. Uh, and that had to be really important. Uh, and foremost, for, in the forefront. Now, 
Um, I discovered to my horror that the women in many islands and children were treated very badly. And so we had what was called the Ways and Means Act. So if you had, uh, or you didn't have a legal uh, legislative basis for something, we would call upon loosely what was called the Ways and Means Act. That is, there had to be some way or some means whereby you could do justice between parties. You could protect the rights of people uh, without offending anybody uh, and uh, by using a, a fairly sophisticated system whereby you could change the rules of court. And in one instance, I actually, it, it got so bad with the rights of women uh, and domestic violence that I changed the rules of court to allow women on islands to make an application any time, day or night, uh, to a judge to get an order, an ex parte order for protection. This would then be broadcast over radio, which was the only way in which one could communicate in the outer islands. So it was a public radio broadcast, uh, which was really quite effective because it meant that everyone on the island knew what was happening. Um, <clears throat> I also uh, caused the court staff to be able to fill in applications and we provided uh, a leaflet uh, as to what the rights were because in Vanuatu their constitution provides rights to women and children and it's one of the few constitutions in the world that actually provides specifically for women which is very good. Uh, I then had another issue to address and that was the trafficking, trafficking of children and <clears throat> I discovered that as part of a bride price, the, in some of the islands, and Tanner is one of them, when a woman gets married, she is a unit of labor, in effect, and she goes to her husband's family. And her husband's family is expected to replace the girl. Now, if they don't have a female child who they can transfer, to the other family, they have to buy a girl in. And that is atrocious uh, and an appalling uh, breach of the rights of a child. And it was human trafficking, there's no doubt about it. Now, it's something which is done in custody. So how to deal with that? It was certainly against the criminal law, but that didn't stop it happening because no one would report it. So uh, I commenced an education program and every island I went on to, to deal with criminal matters, I would have the public prosecutor, I would have the public defender, and I would ensure that there were senior police women uh, who were also with me. And we would talk to the chiefs and we would talk to the senior women on the island about the rights of women and children, and specifically about rights of children not to be the subject of trafficking. So it was an educational program uh, which was uh, commenced, and that was fairly important. So, and I uh, also had another case where we had a child uh, who needed protection, the child had somehow landed in Vanuatu from the Congo. We had no idea how she got there. She was 14 uh, or thereabouts. And it was a matter of then using the inherent jurisdiction of the court, but within the framework of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now the country had, Vanuatu had signed onto the convention, but had not actually brought it into domestic, uh, the domestic laws. But I used that as a guide as to the uh, protection of, the ch of children and as an expression 
of the rights of the child um, and the, the parliament of Vanuatu uh, had obviously agreed to that. And I could do that within the common law system uh, that existed in Vanuatu. Um, <clears throat> Vanuatu is a lovely country. It was very challenging. Um, we had a chief justice who was ultimately impeached because of some action that he took during a coup d'etat or attempted coup d'etat. That caused a great deal of difficulty. Uh, and the provision of aid in those circumstances was a great challenge. Uh, I went back later uh, in 1999 and became the Solicitor General because the State Law Office had collapsed. Uh, but that's perhaps another story. Uh, because that led to the introduction of anti-money laundering and also further rights, uh, dealing with uh, also the TRIPS legislation, uh, bringing that in and many other things, but maybe that's for another time. So if I can move on to Cambodia. Now, um, <clears throat> I'll give you a little bit of background to my appointment. Um, in 1998, I was appointed uh, a Queen's Council in Australia, which was a recognition that some people regarded me as a senior lawyer uh, in Australia. And I had been, at that point, I'd been working for the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, and a number of other uh, organizations, uh, AusAid, uh, and I was involved then in international aid. Uh, and I was uh, in uh, 2005 uh, at the Asian Development Bank uh, in Manila, uh, doing some work as special counsel. And I received a telephone call from the Australian foreign minister asking me if I would uh, be interested in working in Cambodia as a judge on the War Crimes Tribunal. Uh, I later discovered that this offer was made because I was the most senior Australian lawyer who'd been working internationally on aid. And I was also a Royal Australian Air Force specialist reservist dealing with war crimes and advising the Australian military on war crimes. So I found myself uh, being nominated by the UN through Australia for a position on the War Crimes Tribunal in Cambodia. Uh, but in 2006, after we were sworn in, and there were, uh, I think, eight or nine of us uh, as international judges, I discovered that I was the only one who'd had any experience at all in Southeast Asia. Uh, the others had had experience in Europe. And uh, there was therefore a cultural vacuum, unfortunately. And the UN had not done a fabulous job in uh, providing a framework for the establishment of this court. So the judges uh, in plenary had to establish this framework and we did it through the procedural rules of court. And we had plenary after plenary after plenary to devise these rules. And at one point, the, the court or the tribunal uh, almost collapsed before it had got underway because of a cultural misunderstanding. Uh, the international uh, judge who was the leader of the plenary for the international internationals had decided that the time for the plenary would be from 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. or thereabouts. This didn't suit to the Cambodian judges because some of them had other jobs which started at five and they had not been consulted. And it was very much a matter of someone who was working from the UN saying, I'm from the UN and therefore you will do what I want. That doesn't work. You have to be inclusive. You have to have an understanding of what people are doing, where they're coming from, what are their, their cultural sensitivities. And in order to understand the cultural sen sensitivities, you have to uh, sit back 
and have absolutely no arrogance at all about your approach. You have to work with people. You have to design something which will be acceptable. Now, we had a, a difficulty that we were working within the French criminal law system, uh, which was designated as being the appropriate system rather than the international system applied by the International Criminal Court. Uh, but we were dealing with international crimes. That caused an immediate difficulty because the system that was uh, instituted was very long-winded. There were investigating judges who repeated everything that the prosecutors had done and the investigators had done. And thus that tribunal is still going today. Uh, and it's now, what, 15 years since it commenced. And that's fairly outrageous. We also had the uh, issue that apparently an intern had failed to remove from the draft law in the UN office a reference to the victims being able to appeal any decision. The problem was the victims had not been involved in the case at an earlier stage. And it's very difficult for someone to come in at the last minute and be involved in a case. So we had to then look at how we would include the victims. And it was vital that the victims in fact be included because what is such a case or what, what are such cases for? Are they to stop impunity so that people who are uh, the leaders uh, will be brought to trial by an international court and they cannot behave in a manner which is so offensive uh, that they get away with it. That's one of the reasons for doing it. The other reason is, though, I think, for the provision of closure for people so that they understand what happened and why it happened. The problem with Vanuatu, though, oh, sorry, with Cambodia was that the tribunal rolled into town some 30 years after the event. And people had spent 30 years coping. And this was all re enlivened for them. Uh, most people of an older generation were suffering from post traumatic stress. There was not one person in that country who was not touched in some way or another by one or more of the two and a half million deaths which occurred. And I think 1.3 million of those were tortured to death and the rest were worked to death and starved to death. So it was fairly horrendous. So we had to look at who was the audience of our judgments and for the court. And we decided very early on that it was the ordinary Cambodian and that our judgments would be written in a manner that was accessible to the ordinary person. We were not addressing the legal world in that sense. And if you look at the judgments of the tribunal, you'll find that they have copious footnotes. That's where the legal rationale is to be found. The verbiage of the actual judgment uh, should be uh, comprehensible. And I think in all by one case that I was involved, one judgment I was involved in, uh, we did that. And the only judgment where we didn't do it was uh, dealing with highly technical legal matters. Uh, and they were a bit much for everybody. Uh, we then also had to look at the definition of victim. Under French law, you have to have a very close pro proximity to the events. But in Vanuatu, sorry, in Cambodia, we decided that, uh, well, my chamber decided that we would expand this definition of victim very much so that if you were touched by the actions, and I can give you an example, a specific example. There was a lady who came along and she wanted to be one of the many thousands of victims who were party to the case. And she said, well, I sat on my front veranda every night and people walked past. They were chained together and 
they were taken by guards, and there were probably 20 or 30 of them. And then the music would be turned on in the village uh, through the loudspeakers, uh, but I would hear a thump as these people were hit on the back of the head and killed and fell into a pit. And then the guards would drag the chain back past my house. Now, under French law, that lady would not have been a victim. But we determined that she was a psychological victim and she was as victimised as someone directly involved because she had an ongoing psychological problem as a consequence. She, was, she lived in fear that she would be in that line of people and she knew what was going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> there was some resistance from a French judge in relation to that, but my Cambodian colleagues all agree. Then <clears throat> we also decided that it was at a very early stage because this was for the one of the reasons for having the court was to include people we gave consent for the broadcast live broadcast of all of the trials we also had the largest uh, gallery of any court in the world and in fact i think in the first case there were thirty-one thousand people who attended the court to look at the trial of doik this was the largest number of people who had ever attended a court, uh, which has been recorded. Uh, the second trial, I think, had more than 250,000 people in attendance. Uh, compare that with the uh, Yugoslav Tribunal, which is not in the geographical area of the crimes, and people simply cannot get there to see the trials. Uh, so it is a different situation. And as judges, we also involved ourselves in outreach, which meant that we went to villages and we spoke to villages. And I'll just uh, finish this part of my uh, talk by talking about one of the questions I was asked one day. And it was by a villager. And she was a very, obviously a very nice woman. Uh, she had been very very much harmed, I think, by what had occurred. And the question was this, every night I gave thanks to the Lord Buddha that I had survived the day. And I prayed to the Lord Buddha that I would survive the night. And in the morning when I woke up, I gave thanks to the Lord Buddha that I had survived the night. I prayed to the Lord Buddha that I would survive the day. And then in the evening, I gave praise again to the Lord Buddha because I had survived. I did this for more than four years. Why? Why did no one come and help us? Why did no one come and save us? Now, that was a very good question because it was almost impossible for me as a judge to answer. But of course, the reason was that the diplomacy, what our diplomats were doing, were sitting back and looking after their interests. They were not overly concerned about the human lives that were being lost in Cambodia. They certainly knew what was happening. And in fact, the Western countries continued to recognise the Khmer Rouge at the UN for many years. It was just extraordinary. And it was a, a pure reflection of the way in which the international community addresses real problems. And I can give you another example, because I had the pleasure of sitting next to Hans Karel, uh, who was the uh, chief lawyer for the UN uh, to uh, uh, Kofi Annan. And when the uh, massacre was, massacres were about to happen in Rwanda, uh, he and Kofi Annan 
spoke to 131 leaders of countries where there was a standing army begging for troops. They spent 72 hours begging for troops. And not one country would provide peacekeepers. And as a result, 800,000 people died. And I find that as a, a, an international jurist and just as a human, an appalling situation and an absolute indictment upon the manner in which our politicians behave. Uh, they do not care uh, about their fellow man. They care about themselves uh, too much. Uh, Self-interest, I'm afraid, is something which uh, destroys humanity. Uh, and the lack of uh, actual empathy is something which is, I think, an appalling situation. So I hope that gives you some idea of just touching about the, the two, ma two major uh, areas that I've been involved in. I've been involved in uh, some in uh, the Solomon Islands uh, during their, their uh, civil war and uh, immediately before Ramsey moved in. Uh, I've been involved in East Timor. Uh, I've worked in Vietnam, uh, Laos and many other countries, Indonesia, and I've found it very fulfilling. Uh, it's been a life that I've, from a rule of law position, looked at the problems which are to be found and to look for solutions, and solutions which will work from a cultural and political point of view within a country, uh, because all countries differ. And you need to find out what is required, what are the sensitivities, uh, and what will work. Because there's no point as someone coming in, uh, either as an operational person or as an advisor, uh, just to go in and say, oh, this is what I think you should do. Um, we have the, the older Paris, the Paris Accords, where there was a consideration of partnership. And that's indeed the only way in which in aid programs uh, and programs generally, uh, you will get any success uh, because otherwise you're wasting the money. Uh, there's no point in spending it. Uh, and not only is it a matter of being culturally sensitive, but you have to ask people what they want. Uh, and if you don't ask that as a primary question, uh, then there's no point in being there. There's no point in attempting to provide assistance. Um, and I've always gone into a country with a view to, of saying, I can, I can take you anywhere you want uh, from a legal point of view, uh, but I do have a couple of requirements. One is that human rights are complied with and they include labor laws. And the second is that ultimately the solutions that come out will benefit people in a very tangible manner. There's no point in doing things for the point of doing them. There needs to be an outcome. And poverty relief is something which is, say, central to the Asian Development Bank work, uh, the advancement there. Education uh, and the development of economies can be important as a way out of poverty. And the lawyers can be very much involved in that. I'm still involved in Vanuatu. I'm still involved in Cambodia, uh, but I'm advising governments uh, now in relation to commercial matters uh, and uh, with a view to assisting people out of poverty. So, all right. So if there are any questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ruan, for sharing your life experience. And it's not just informative, very you know, perceptive at the same time. Uh, particularly, I'm really grateful that you share some of the, uh, the insider story about how you actually uh, wanted to make things work in Vanuatu, you know, uh, navigating um, the whole the complex situation, which may look a bit chaotic from outsider's perspective. And I really appreciate that. And also, as a person who had been looking into the Cambodian post-conflict settings, 
I really appreciate the what you had done, particularly to make the whole the legal process more accessible to many people. Um, well, a few a couple of years ago, I had a chance to interview some of the community members who had gone through those, um, you know, Khmer Rouge, um, the, the challenging period of time under the Khmer Rouge ruling. And then I had a question to ask about, you know, whether they are aware of the ongoing tribunal, ECCC. And then because I was clearly aware of those, you know, the separation uh, from those legal cases and the public awareness in many other countries like Rwanda, I was expected to, you know, I, I was expected to hear that, well, I don't, really don't know what was happening there. But a surprisingly big number of people say that, yeah, I had a chance to actually go and watch the whole the hearing, you know, sessions. And then I was introduced to different mechanisms related to ECCC. I was quite surprised by the big number of people who actually share those, their personal experience of visiting and watching over uh, you know, watching at those uh, hearing sessions. Now I can see that, you know, part of the reason is actually the effort that you had made in that establishment process. So thank you so much. I'd like just, to just, add, the, oh, sorry, so just in relation to that, if I can add, we had uh, in the first case, I think uh, about 4,000 people who joined as civil parties. And one of the, and they were all victims, and one of the fears was that they were going to be asking for money. Uh, we had no money. We couldn't give compensation. And when we went through all these applications, because we had to go through each one, uh, it was interesting. I think there was one person uh, who asked for monetary compensation. Everybody else wanted recognition of what had occurred. And they, for instance, asked for a stupor to be erected in honor or, or in memory of those who died in the village. And that was, I think, a very good approach uh, because they recognized there was no money and no mo and money could not compensate for what they'd lost. They wanted recognition. That was really important. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Mm. Thank you. Just let me ask a couple of questions as a starting right point for the conversation. Uh, when you talked uh, about your experience in Vanuatu, you really wanted to make the whole the decision-making process more inclusive and you really wanted to listen to people. But in some cultural context, when people are you know, standing in front of the people who look senior, like <coughs> judge, you know, people often feel very scared of expressing their opinions. And often they say that, well, my village leader's opinion is my, my opinion. So often, even though you have good intention to hear their views, it's not always straightforward to actually yeah. capture the complexity. Uh, can you share your experience with relevant yeah. to it? Yes, it was, uh, it was interesting, and you're quite right. In Vanuatu, um, most people don't like to look a big man in the eye, for instance. They will look down on the ground and be incredibly deferential. Um, it was a matter, the view that I took was that I would put people at ease as much as possible. Uh, and I would do that by way of uh, talking to them, explaining the process of the court to them. Uh, I even had one lawyer who I had actually known in Melbourne. She came across to do a course in Melbourne and she appeared before me and was so nervous she couldn't function. So it was, they were ex parte matters she had, and uh, I adjourned and we had a cup of tea just to get her to relax. Uh, but it's a matter of being culturally sensitive. Again, uh, it is a cultural issue. And if people understand what the process is, if people understand you're not going to be angry with them, you just want to know what the position is or the situation is, uh, then they will function and you will achieve what you need to achieve from a legal point of view, um, but also a personal point of view, because you don't want people in, a, in the situation, in any situation to feel uncomfortable, um, particularly when you come in as an outsider and you're attempting to provide some assistance. You don't want, you don't want to put people in a situation where they're pushing back. You want to include them 
in the, uh, the situation. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question actually raised by <coughs> Will here. Let me just uh, uh, read it out on, on behalf of Will. I have a question about the impact of Bitcoin and the rule of law in the Pacific. This isn't my area at all. Uh, we have a colleague at Otago who works on it, you know, a person called Olivia Jutel. But I am interested in the fact that aid agencies have been prom promoting it as a means of addressing difficulties in, within cash in, for example, Vanuatu. But at the same time, there seems to be a fear that the decentralization of Bitcoin will serve to undermine sovereignty, especially in small Pacific nations, which might not really have other means to buttress their sovereignty. Um, so one, may I invite you? Right. Uh, that's something I'm not an expert in, uh, although I have a son who's an expert in Bitcoin. Uh, but it's interesting because there's a South American country which has now adopted um, Bitcoin as one of its official currencies, which now means that the IMF have to adopt it as a currency uh, within their realms. Uh, I think that the, the issue is really one of uh, remittance and how to get remittance uh, to people, say from the workers who go to New Zealand or go to Australia. Uh, how do you transfer the remittance uh, in? Now, look, I, I don't know what the attitude is in Vanuatu, for instance. Um, and I don't know of, because I haven't looked, I suppose, uh, but I can guess that the Pacific countries have not uh, looked at this matter very carefully or closely at the moment. Uh, are they in a position to do something about it? I think they probably are. Um, I think in Vanuatu, their anti-money laundering legislation is strong enough uh, for them to be able to inquire into this uh, and to maybe urge controls. Um, but again, how do you do that from a practical point of view? I'm not sure. Uh, although I do understand some wallets have recently been opened online and some hundreds of millions of dollars have been recovered. Uh, but I just don't know, uh, I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Mm. And um, actually also related to your comments on the Cambodian uh, tribunal cases, one question that I have is that often when we hear those kind of um, the court sessions, there are two conflicting narratives are presented. You know, one side actually argues that these people are the, the people who are responsible for killings. The other side often argued that, well, I just did what I was ordered for. If I hadn't really done that, I would have been executed by my senior. Something like this. So there is a kind of competing narratives that who actually is responsible for it. And similar kind of competing narratives that I have seen in both Cambodia and Rwanda, or even in the during the Nuremberg um, mm -hmm. tribunals. How do you see, you know, when you actually hear those kind of points, um, how do you normally react? <clears throat> Can you also give some general comments about these competing narratives? Right. Um, they're not really competing in one way. Uh, and they're not competing in, because at international law, uh, you have a duty not to comply with those orders. Uh, you may not uh, carry, out, carry out the order. Now, the consequences of that can be horrendous. You can lose your life as a consequence. Uh, I think that there were quite a number of people, and strangely, Hun Sen was one of them, who removed themselves from the jurisdiction in Cambodia. And that is the correct thing to do. You remove yourself. Um, now, <clears throat> there are practical issues with that because not everyone could do it. In fact, very few people could actually remove themselves. So uh, it's, it comes down to how do you resolve that uh, within a society? And you probably resolve it within a society by uh, having a truth and reconciliation commission process. 
if you've, if you've decided not to have a trial of everyone involved. And that's quite obviously what's happened uh, in Cambodia. They only wanted uh, the senior leaders and those most responsible to be the subject of uh, the court action. Uh, they have not had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I think is a great shame. I think they needed to do that. Um, and whether that will happen in the future, I doubt that it would still be a good idea. But it is one of the very difficult questions of international law uh, as to what do people do. But the duty is clear. You have committed a crime if you carry out the order. Thank you very much. Right. Um, the next question can be a little bit trickier. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me asking this question. Um, it is actually about the format of the court hearing or truth, you know, from broad perspectives, truth and uh, truth finding system. In some cultural contexts, like, um, you know, Solomon Islands, often people don't really want to talk about their, um, you know, pain or the victimization because particularly in some cases, women, when they share kind of their experience of being raped, actually before people actually think about those victimization itself, people are worrying about being, you know, recognized as a woman who had gone through those kind of horrendous experience. And so there is a cultural kind of pressure um, that um, make, you know, these people uh, feel very difficult to speak um, and often they don't really want to share. If this is the case, you know, in those kind of contexts, probably the fact, or, you know, that can a legal system or truth finding commission can identify can be quite limited. And uh, have you experienced this kind of uh, challenging issues before? Yes. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, well, say in the Vanuatu context, uh, you have to be aware of the sensitivities uh, and you have to protect the victim. Uh, it is exceedingly important. It's the paramount uh, thing. So that uh, the, the system of having the victim somewhere else is now so that they're, they're not actually in the courtroom, so that they're in another room and you use audio visual equipment. And in circumstances where the, uh, the accused cannot see them and they cannot see the accused. Uh, and they know that that's the case, and so that they're protected. Uh, but they, they can be heard, uh, which is important. Uh, in the Cambodian situation, um, we had uh, people who would, for instance, um, go to a village to take evidence. Uh, the evidence would be beamed back live into the court, and that was done in a sensitive manner so that someone's face would not be recognized. Uh, and it made it much easier for them. It was much less confrontational. And in Cambodia, uh, as with Vanuatu, people don't like confrontation. Uh, so the court has to make allowance for that uh, and provide facilities to ensure that uh, uh, people are able to function and tell their story such as it is. Um, in Cambodia, of course, one of the difficulties also is um, that of reconstructed memory, because it's so long after the event. Uh, and that's, but that's another issue uh, as to the difficulties. Uh, and sometimes people come forward and you suspect that it's reconstructed memory rather than actual memory. And you have to make allowances for that as well. Again, to me, it you know really emphasizes again the importance of the accurate examination of the cultural context and social context yeah. where this court system is operated. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, my last question is more personal, actually. Um, when you are dealing with many yeah. of these you know challenging legal cases, you may often find some you know occasions quite emotionally challenging. When you face yourself as a human being. What do you normally do? How do you, you know, uh, deal yeah. with the inner anxiety and stress yourself? Yeah, it's very stressful, uh, particularly with the war crimes, um, because, and I won't tell you any of the facts because most of them are so horrific. Um, 
I would every two weeks or so have a call from a relative uh, by marriage who is a very senior uh, medical practitioner and I would um, talk to him offload because you have to. Uh, you can't keep it bottled up uh, because it is just so distressing uh, in many ways. And you need to do that because uh, you can't function otherwise. Uh, you have to keep some level plane. Uh, and you cannot, for instance, get very angry with people. I, I recall in Vanuatu, uh, there was one rape, which was the most horrendous rape. It was not the first case that I heard, but it was the most horrendous rape that I have ever come across. And I remanded the prisoner uh, for something in the order of three months before sentencing him because it took me that long to calm down uh, and to process uh, my emotional approach to the, the matter. Uh, and because it was really, really very distressing. Thank you so much, Norman, mm -hmm. uh, for having shared the you know, great experience and also deciding to spend an hour, your precious time with us I really appreciate that you you actually work up very early morning, you know, from Europe to uh, make this um, workshop um, the seminar happen. Thank you. Um, right. Also, I'd like to thank Professor Sweetman <coughs> who kindly joined us today to actually welcome and um, on behalf of the university the, and then also introduce Rowan to the audience. Thank you. Pleasure. And I would like to also like to appreciate the Matsunaga Peace Institute at the University of Hawaii, who is going to actually share, you know, who had advertised this event and going to share this video clip with the local community members in Hawaii. And also want to thank the e-conferencing team of the university who had facilitated all this Zoom session for us. Thank you so much for this uh, very seemingly, you know, uh, seemingly seamless kind of operation of this whole arrangement. And also you know, all the participants who uh, you know dedicate their time to join us today and also who are going to watch this video clip later on i, I thank you um so once again rowan thank you so much for you know spending time with us and i would all like all of you have a great afternoon thank you thank you